looming battle between resurrected gods casts a shadow over the fate of the world in The Hunger of the Gods. That's the book I'm reviewing on this episode of SFF 180. Hello again, everyone. Thomas here, your host as always. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, I'm reviewing the second book of a trilogy in today's video, so be aware that spoilers for the first book are going to be plentiful. In the expansive second installment of his Norse-inspired Bloodsworn saga, John Gwynn sticks to the principle of all ambitious epic fantasy sequels. More of everything, but bigger. The Hunger of the Gods follows right on the heels of the Shadow of the Gods, and the gods here have a whole lot of hunger to satisfy. A hunger for revenge, a hunger for justice, a hunger to settle old scores. This is blood and thunder stuff to do the ghost of Robert E. Howard proud. And it might well be the best long-form storytelling Gwyn has accomplished to date. The dragon god Lick Rifa has been restored to life from her prison beneath the bleak northern wastes of Oskutreth in the continent of Vigrith. And as you might suspect, she is extremely pissed. With the warband of the Raven Feeders backing her, led by the aptly named Ilska the Cruel, Likrifa is summoning all of the Vaisen, the creatures who broke free from the bowels of the earth at the climax of the war that destroyed all the ancient gods, into battle. Orca Skull Splitter has reunited with the Bloodsworn, the famed warband she once led before abandoning them for a life of peace and domesticity, but she is still obsessively focused on finding her son Brekka, abducted by Drekker of the Raven Feeders, along with multiple other tainted children to be used in the ritual to revive Likrifa. The tainted carry the blood of the old gods in their veins, and as we have discovered, every member of the Bloodsworn, as well as the Raven Feeders, is one. Which leads me to think the first book really missed an opportunity by not including a scene in which all the characters point to each other like the Spider-Man meme. Meanwhile, Elvar, now chief of the Battlegrim, has managed to place thrall collars upon no less than the resurrected wolf god Ulfrir and his daughter Skuld, and plans to compel their aid in killing Likrifa once and for all. Gwyn punctuates his tale in which Disparate warbands forge desperate alliances as the fate of the world looks increasingly dire, with not only bloody, bone-crushing action scenes, but more attention to character and deeper immersion into the world of the story. In addition to the first novel's three viewpoint characters, Orca, Elvar, and the former Thrall, now Bloodsworn warrior Varg, we get two more. The villainous Guthvar is a deeply pathetic, cowardly little weasel whose every action is motivated by the most sniveling self-preservation. But there's something about what a complete loser he is that brings this novel a refreshing sense of comic relief that the Shadow of the Gods quite honestly lacked. Guthvar is a dismal failure of a man, and yet somehow he manages to keep failing upward, staying alive while death rains down on everyone around him. And the traitorous Bjorn, the raven feeder who infiltrated the Battlegrim as a spy, struggles with just enough guilt over his deeds that he nearly makes a fateful mistake. I do have some gripes here. Now, most fans of this series declare Orca their favorite character, but her single-minded focus on where's my son, where's my son, frankly makes her feel to me like she has the least depth of anyone. Moreover, Gwyn has the Bloodsworn be a little too forgiving, a little too bygones be bygones about the way Orca and her late husband Thorkel simply walked away from them. I mean, it's not as if they're exactly happy with her after all this time, but considering that one of the rules Gwyn has established for his world is that there is literally nothing more sacred and important than an oath, well, they still seem too willing to shed their resentment and welcome her back into their good graces. Everyone else is, to be honest, far more interesting. Elvar must wrestle with the newfound responsibilities of leading her warband, while Var grows more into the family that he has found among the Bloodsworn after spending all of his life as a thrall. In the popular grim dark tradition, Gwyn has given us a world in which the good guys aren't necessarily always good and the bad guys aren't necessarily always bad. 
Likrifa and her followers plan to go to war for what seems like a completely moral cause, the liberation of the tainted from slavery, violence, and oppression. Gwyn keeps the novel pacey, despite its being over a hundred pages longer than Shadow, and he builds momentum and tension impressively in the final third as events build to their climax and the next volume is set up. Overall, this is fantastic entertainment for fantasy readers who like their epics to ring with the clang and clash of steel and the rush of dragon wings in cold gray skies. Now, if that's you, I promise it will leave you hungry for more. And that is all I have time for on this episode of SFF 180. Remember, most important thing, these are reviews. You're not always going to agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe if you have not done so. That is how the channel grows. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where recruits into Wink's army sometimes get little perks, like early access to some of my videos if I happen to finish them <laughs> early enough. But I do appreciate that added support because I use the Patreon money to pay Matt Olson, my brilliantly talented channel artist who does all of my wonderful thumbnails and things for me. So thank you all so much. I want to thank all the rest of you guys for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube. And until I see all of you next time, please stay safe and healthy and happy reading.